Welcome to VC and Early Stage Company Pitch Workshop and Q&A, presented by Latham & Watkins, with David Agilat, Latham & Watkins, Peter Liu, Pritzker Group, Anargya Vardana, Maveron, and Kevin Zhang, Upfront Ventures. Son, yeah, how's it going, guys? Hopefully we have a pretty interesting panel and uh, we're going to do some pitches today, so we're excited about that. Thanks for coming out. I am looking for my sheet. There we go. So my name is David Agilat. I'm an attorney with Latham & Watkins uh, at Latham. We represent a ton of VR emerging companies and we help them do everything from starting at formation to fundraising to exit, whether it's M&A or IPO. Uh, I'm really excited today to introduce you to some fantastic folks here, all of whom have invested in VR companies. Uh, so they're all, all in, and by the way, when I say VR, I mean AR, MR, everything, mixed reality. Uh, we're just gonna use VR as a general term. So with that, it would be great to get to know you guys a little bit. So how many founders do we have here? Okay, a ton, awesome. What about people that wanna be founders? Okay, there we go, a few of those are. <laughs> And uh, uh, VR companies, AR companies, what do we got? VR, raise your hand. AR, hardware, yeah, mixed reality, cameras, anything like that? Okay, cool. Well, we will try to uh, keep the questions so that they're on point for you all. We want this to be really interactive, so please, at any point, raise your hand, ask a question. We want you to take advantage of these people's knowledge as much as you can uh, and get the most out of this to the extent that you can. So let's meet the panel. All right, why doesn't everybody introduce themselves? Tell us their first VR experience, what you love, hate about it, and maybe a little bit about your funds. Sure, uh, Peter Liu with Pritzker Group Venture Capital, uh, based here in Los Angeles. Uh, lead the firm's efforts in the VR and AR investment spaces. Um, my first VR experience that, that was memorable to me, there's a lot of non-memorable ones. Uh, the, the most memorable one was South by Southwest, probably four years ago, three years ago, four years ago, Game of Thrones, uh, Scaling the Wall. Uh, that, that was the one that blew me away with six staff on Oculus and uh, actually felt like falling down the walls and the arrows coming over and that, that just got me hooked ever since. Hi everybody, my name is Anargia. I'm with Maveron. I'm based in San Francisco. We are a consumer-only venture capital firm, so we invest in direct-to-consumer tech brands, uh, including VR, AR, mixed reality. Uh, my first, and the first one was memorable for me, first VR experience was Altspace VR about three years ago. And I was sitting in a room with my sister in real life, and we were throwing boxes at each other, and I jumped out of the seat and ripped the cords out, and it was amazing to me to feel that kind of presence in a virtual environment, and I've been hooked ever since. Hey guys, uh, Kevin Zane, I work at Upfront Ventures here in Los Angeles. Uh, we're an early stage investor, uh, very broad across consumer, enterprise, software, hardware, and even the sciences. Um, I play a lot of games, so got into VR a few years ago. Uh, first memorable experience was probably Tilt Brush. Uh, that was the one that really captured my attention. Um, I also realized that I'm not very good at drawing. Uh, so. And then I handed it to a, uh, the son of one of my colleagues who was, I think, eight or something like that. And he proceeded to draw a flaming car and then put up a mirror and reflected it in the mirror so it almost looked like a real car. And I was like, all right, I think you have a future in the creative arts. So anyway, that was probably the, one of the most memorable experiences. Awesome. Uh, so just to set the table, would you guys mind telling us your fund size, your average tech size, like what, what stage you invest in and all of that stuff? Uh, Pritzker Group's an evergreen fund, uh, so no outside LPs. Uh, we look to deploy $100 million a year across the country in the U.S. Average check sizes are 3 to $10 million, so typically a Series A, Series B round. Um, our core investment is the Series A, where we're typically leading rounds, writing 2 to $8 million checks or so. We do a lot of seed investing as well. Um, so seed and Series A and our fund size is in the 150 range. Uh, we're also Series A focused. First check on average about three to five million dollars. Uh, fund five is three hundred million. Who wants money? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. 
Um, so we have some pre-submitted questions from the audience, and I think one of them is pretty on point right now. So is Sarah Hill here from Story Up? She's not here. So her question was, do you fund VR content companies? Why and why not? Anybody want to take that one? Um, I've looked at a lot of VR content companies. Uh, haven't really funded any. I think sort of at this early stage of the sort of uh, you know introduction of a new platform, a new medium, it's, it's very challenging to have enough audience uh, sort of to generate venture returns. Um, I think what is potentially <laughs> sustainable is you know you are building content to sort of show off some core piece of technology whether it's a content creation tool whether it's um, you know tools that allow you to let's say work across multiple platforms whatever it is that gives you a scaling edge uh, for your content and other people's content over time uh, if you're doing that then then yes we would be interested but you know at the core that is more that's a hybrid content sort of platform tools company yeah, we we actually make it a point not to fund content, um, given the it, it's it's extremely difficult to scale and it's typically hits driven um, in our industry and the t and the stage of companies that we invest in are so early and risky already. To add that l extra layer of complexity um, is just a decision that we've made not to do at our fund. With that said, I think you know this is an industry right now that is has a huge shortage of content. Um, and as VCs, uh, we play a really big role in terms of subsidizing the growth of, of VR and AR. Um, and you know, to, to Kevin's point, to the you know, it's something that we may make an exception to um, if we believe that the core technology underlying that content can then be scalable and sold as a technology. Um, I'll add one more thing. Yeah, we also don't fund content-based companies, and not just in VRIR, but also in traditional tech startups. So we don't do content media. And certainly in the last five, 10 years, we have seen content media companies have outsized returns and be really successful, such as BuzzFeed, Refinery29, and beyond. And I think there are a certain type of VC that has seen success in that and maybe have a bigger appetite for VR content. And I'd suggest kind of going after those folks. So. You're not dead if you're a content company for raising money, by the way. Um, I, I think that, so it is very tough for VC, but strategics are very interested in, in pushing content, especially a lot of the hardware folks that you see here today. So all's not lost, and angel investors are also a very good source for funding content. So with that, I do have another question for you guys. So what, so what do you look in a company that you do want to invest in? Is there anything that stands out like, wow, that is a company that I should be investing in, especially in the VR, AR space? Yeah, I can jump in there. So like many of the folks here on stage, we're investing really early stage seed and series A. And for us, the number one thing we're looking at at that stage is the founder and team and really making sure we're betting on the right people. And early on, I would say 18 months or so ago, we used to see folks that were really strong technologists. But for us as consumer only investors, we didn't see people who really understood how to either drive consumer adoption or test around consumers or build something that really delights and engages your user base, even though the user base is still small. And in the last six months to eight months, we have really seen people who are at the intersection of being excellent technologists, but who also understand consumer psychology and the importance of it in a VR experience and who are able to, to really bridge that gap. And I think a, a good example of that is, is the Rec Room uh, by Against Gravity. If any of you have, have been in the Rec Room, it, they think a lot about how, what do people do in here? Why do they do it? Do they need friends? Et cetera, et cetera. So I think people who get that. Yeah, kind of along those lines, I think you know it's early enough in VR and AR that things are changing all the time. So you know your interactions with an investor is not you know, a moment in time, one meeting, and you're done, right? So make sure, just like you're thinking about your users' needs, you need to think about continuously showing progress, um, and thinking a little bit outside the box, trying to push the boundary of, you know, what you can do on the platform as opposed to just seeing, oh, someone else did X, and let me throw that element into my current experience. So I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunities <coughs> to show very, very rapid progress um, in your product, and that, you know, aside from the, obviously, the team thing uh, is what impresses VCs the most. Yeah, so we. We invest both consumer and enterprise, and actually two of our three VR investments have been on the enterprise side. Um, we think virtual reality will touch all aspects of society uh, and business, and there's a lot of pain points within businesses today that uh, require either 
you know, a lot of physical models, uh, a lot of costs associated with travel, um, you know, how, a lot of space that's required to do something or danger around training and being in hazardous environments that we think being in a virtual environment can dramatically reduce all of those pain points. And so um, we're looking for the wow factor when, when we're looking into enterprises saying, wow, this is 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times better than the status quo because we can render this in a virtual environment and get rid of all of the different pain points associated with that. On the consumer side, I think what we really look for is a company that ultimately can stand within its you know, two feet, um, on its two feet. So not really requiring um, external distribution channels uh, in the long term. In the short term, you're always going to have to leverage what exists today. But in the long term, can you build a company that attracts users, retain users, um, addicted users within your four walls uh, and keep them there? Um, and so that's what we're looking for on that side. And, and usually that's with a founder that is so passionate about an idea that may sound wacky at first, it may sound like, wow, this, this is so strange for me to explain in an investment committee meeting internally, but um, once you try it, you're, you think, wow, I, I have to keep using this. Awesome. So if I want to start a company or I have a company and I have my team and I'm building a product, but I need investors, how do I get access to you? How do I meet you? How do I get connected with you if I don't know you? Do cold emails work? Do I need to find somebody that knows you? Yeah, I mean, always try to get a warm intro. I mean, look, there's so many resources out there that actually lists all the VR companies, who is invested in them, the number of investments they made, even who you know, the partner or the person is who did that deal. You can look, you can look up all those information right, and figure out what this fund might or might not like to do. Uh, make sure you go in very informed. And then you know, go through LinkedIn or your friend's group, et cetera, and, and try to find a warm intro. I was told that if you cold email this particular VC I was talking to, they'll just hard delete it right away. Um, OK, so you get the intro to the VC, or you find a way that you have an intro to somebody. What do you share with them? Do VCs sign NDAs? No. So what do you feel comfortable sending them on that first meeting, especially if you've realized that, hey, this investor has invested in companies that are similar to me, they could be potentially competitive with me. How much should I share? I would say, you know, in, in, in this business, it's all about execution in startups. So, you know, I would shout in your idea and get as much feedback about it as possible and not be worried about copycats. I, you know, you don't have to share the technical details um, with about your company or your product if, if that's something that is, you know, your core secret sauce. But I would share as much information as you can so the VCs that you talk to can make an informed decision on whether or not to continue those conversations with you. Um, I hope this goes without saying, but you'd be surprised the number of meetings I'm in where there isn't a demo. So either send the demo if a VC is investing in VR, I guarantee you they have access to hardware. Send the demo, do the meeting, have, have the demo, be a part of the meeting. And, um, and a big reason why people don't realize VCs don't sign NDAs is we're seeing five, 10 companies a day, several a week, several a month. There is no malicious intent to go like, or for, hopefully for most people, there isn't malicious intent to go say, so-and-so is doing this, so-and-so is doing that. But when there's tons of companies flowing through your mind and inbox, you may accidentally say something. And so that NDA can, can be tricky there. Um, yeah, like Peter said, like at the end of the day, it's execution. So if you have an amazing idea and you're gonna actually move on it, that, that's your advantage. Awesome. So just sticking with that, so how many companies do you see a week? How many decks do you see a week or a month? How many make it to a meeting? How many make it to the second meeting? How many make it to the partner meeting? And how many get invested in? It's about 1% of all meetings that we take uh, end up being investments for us. So it's a pretty, pretty small number. Yeah. and. For, for venture capital math to work, we need, based on our fund sizes, we need pretty big outcomes. And you know there are amazing companies that will be amazing companies and will be great for the founder. The founder has 50% ownership, and they can make quite a bit of money. But it may not necessarily be the scale of return that a VC needs with their 10, 15, 20% ownership. And so 
you know, I see three to five companies a day, uh, have several more kind of flow through the inbox. A small portion of those make the partner meeting. And even after that, after multiple sessions of really digging in and diligence, even smaller amount actually get invested. And even after that, a still smaller amount are going to be those big kind of hits that we hear about. Yeah, I mean, VCs see a lot of companies. Um, and I think you <laughs> need a, <laughs> you know, number, I mean, sort of what we already talked about, how do you stand out, right? Um, like, you got to go into super well research. Like, if you are not aware, for example, of who your competitors are and you're cagey about talking about things and your VC, the VC is like, oh, aren't you just the same as that other company? Um, that's probably not, <laughs> not a good way to go about the meeting. Uh, but yeah, typically for VCs, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, there's usually about two models. One where it's very sort of single person driven, where you kind of try to find that champion who you know either is really obsessed with the space that you're in or has a history with you or whatever it is. And that person is the one that will ultimately do the deal and try to get the rest of the partnership <laughs> sort of uh, you know convinced to do it. Or you have more of a consensus model where you know uh, everyone or at least a few people who either typically really like that space or really or, or don't like that space um, have to sort of be convinced that this is the right sort of the right investment so um, <laughs> definitely think about sort of multiple angles of approach as well and that's important and it's not you know you, you half the time is not just one person that you're dealing with yeah that, that's a really great point especially for this audience um, because AR and VR is such a new category for most VC firms that oftentimes you're going to be faced with one champion maybe maybe two within a within a firm and most VCs are partnerships right so th it may not be consensus but you do have a discussion around the table where everyone chimes in it's really important for you as entrepreneurs when you're pitching to that firm to find out who the champion is and really understand the firm's th thoughts around VR and AR because if the firm isn't bought in as much you have to convince the champion, that individual, and then that individual has to convince the firm, and it just adds another layer to the process for you, uh, and time is everything when you're executing a startup. Uh, I just recall when we were making our last VR investment in the consumer space, which we'd never done before, it took six months or so of just convincing my partnership to say, hey, now is a good time to be investing in consumers when the headset penetration is still so low. I was dragging my partners to my house to, want to, to try the product so they could see it and understand it. So it's a slog, but so that's one thing off the bat when you're meeting with a firm, you should try to, try to gauge. I'm, I'm gonna add one more thing. I think because this industry is still nascent, what I'm seeing more than in any other vertical is uh, professional people who are brought into the company, like business people, to pitch, to get access to VCs. And in my experience, that is almost never an authentic, good, successful way to attract the VC's attention, to actually convince them to invest. Um, you are the founder of the company. You are building this day in and day out. You know it upside down, right side up. And you are the authentic person to talk about this. Um, you know, talk to friends, talk to people in your network to get some coaching or help or to really figure out the best way to talk about it. But I strongly encourage that it should be you who's talking about it, not, not someone you bring in from the outside world to, to pitch it or to attract some capital. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions before we hit the, uh, the pitches. So what about this? How do you guys feel about IP protection? Do you think it's important for early stage VR companies? Should they be filing patents? Should they be getting copyrights and trademarks? Or is it not as important when you're looking at the deals at this stage? Software IP is not that important, generally speaking. Don't waste your money, guys. All right, awesome. Um, so I think we should start setting up the pitches. Uh, I, I hear that we have maybe five companies that want to pitch today. Is that right? Six. Maybe even six. OK. Do you want to kind of share the process here? Yeah. OK. So we have maybe six pitches, 90 seconds, and then a short Q&A to follow. So you'll see a timer up in the top right corner if you're pitching. And so just keep an eye on it, and uh, good luck. Who's first? Hello. Should I start? Just like go wait for a timer. timer. It's like a game, okay? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, so nice to meet you guys. My name is Michael Cazzelli, and I'm a CEO of the, and a founder of a company that's doing virtual reality. We have two, two products, but our main product is an e-commerce platform. And the way we approach it is a little bit different than the other e-commerce platform as we research. We are actually uh, developed a method to make a very uh, cheap virtual reality simulations for pre-sales pre pre of real estate because we try to make a website that people can upload their 3D products there for like a $50 subscription a month, you know, and get virtual reality. So we managed to, in Unreal, in Unreal Engine, to write the platform in a way that we have like templates and we can do really fast simulation in a high quality for pre-sales of virtual reality real estate. And the way we approach the e-commerce is we want to partner with stores and when uh, people are seeing this pre pre future apartment of them in the real estate office, they can pre-design it with our store and buy it later from our website. And that's, we just believe, will be a very efficient way now because user base for virtual reality e-commerce is <clears throat> very small now. Because people, like the consumers, they don't have virtual reality yet. And, and, and people do buy apartments in big condo uh, buildings, and people do go to interior designers to redesign their homes. So that's it. <laughs> so I think we have four minutes for feedback. Go for it. Questions and feedback, yeah. Can you clarify a little bit, is it home goods products that you are rendering in VR, or the actual homes and the condos themselves? So we are doing the pre-sales, uh, sorry, the simulation of the house for the, for the company, for, for the real estate, for instance. But what we're selling is everything, is the flooring, is the appliances, is the furniture, and like even decorations. We just need to partner with stores and we're like the dealer, basically. And we cheap, we're uh, half a dollar for, for a square feet, which is a ridiculous price for simulations in VR, you know. Do you, do you sell to the interior designer? Who pays for your product? Uh, the, the building company is paying because they have a pre-sale tool for their apartments. But the vision is that we make a tool for uh, 3D designers to use for free and then use our library of partners and make work, cheap work for, you know, for, for their clients. And we are the dealer, so it's kind of like this. Are you going for um, commercial real estate? Uh, residential, high end, mid end, low end. Residential, mostly. What, what, what high end, low end, mid end? What, what kind of residential? Uh, mostly residential and mostly uh, middle to high end. And we're talking more about the uh, building condos because the business model is for a proof of concept at least will work better there because you have 50 condos in a, you know, in a building and it's. Yeah. So, so the builders are they uploading? How do they get the? The, sure. the building into your environment? Oh, Is so it uploading as, a BIM model or something like that? So as now we have uh, designers, we actually a team of like five or six people, right now it's six with another guy. We have a designer in, uh, uh, two designers in uh, Portugal and one in uh, France and uh, one guy so in- you're uh, designing the models? Yes, we're designing it from, from sketches or from 3D models. And we have like a shortcut that will make it look very nice in HTC Vive, we, we're working with, it, with this, yeah. So. And, and where are you in product development, business partnerships? Sure. A business partnership, we are, we are still, uh, I'm, I'm just a co-founder. I, I, I spend uh, my money on it for a year. And uh, the product is ready, uh, the virtual reality simulation, the store is working. We just need now to connect it to the server and get partners inside, you know, stores. So. so I guess really quick um, thoughts. Uh, I've actually looked at a number of companies in this space. I do think for a complex purchase like real estate, VR is pretty good. Um, <laughs> the current experience of you actually having to visit the homes, obviously people do that, but you can only visit so many homes. So <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting proposition. I would say you know, at the end of the day, it's all about sort of how you scale on how you make this as easy as possible for your customers which in this case will be the actual builders or the condo owners, or maybe even the real estate brokers. You have to make it so easy for them to just turnkey, take yeah. their existing assets that they already have, and turn it into something 
that they can show their clients, whether it's at the condo's office or at the broker's office. Um, if you know, if this requires a really convoluted process, then you know, good luck getting that going. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to to that to answer that we're actually counting on on future pre, so on pre-sales of properties, not on existing projects. I know we're cutting the market by that. But by our research, more than a, a million and a half buildings are built in the United States. So every condo building, as I said, 50 condos, it can be still a big business model because every purchase can, in general, get to $100,000. Yeah, I yeah. like this space. We invested in Iris VR, yeah. which is doing this on the industrial and the commercial uh -huh. real estate side. Um, their secret sauce was on the customer acquisition being able to have that converter that allows you to take a traditional BIM model or whatever model you've built in SketchUp, Revit, whatever, yeah, no. and immediately convert that into uh, a VR environment. Yeah. And then you use the plat their platform to edit that afterwards. Yeah, I like it a lot as well, the idea, but <clears throat> the visuals are, I believe, not, not convincing enough for the people to actually buy in, their, in the e-commerce. That's my only issue was with what I saw. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Ready? Go. What do you think when you hear the word education? Boring, waste of time. If these thoughts don't come to mind, then you're in the minority. Because the majority of students report that they see little value in learning the tough subjects. Have you ever wondered why students today are learning the same way they learned 100 years ago. Unfortunately, institutional education is the worst example of this is how things have always been done. At Codon, we believe there's a better way to learn. That's why we're creating the tools and content to help students and educators augment their education beyond the classroom. I know what you might be thinking, if students don't want to learn in the classroom, why would they want to learn in VR? My answer, proof is in the pudding. Visit our booth and see why students are getting excited about learning in VR. My name is Renee Vandenboss, and I'm the founder of Codon. Thank you. I think. Um, Many of us are, are definitely on board and convinced that you can learn and experience learning materials in VR in a very different, unique, and perhaps more compelling, exciting way. Um, could you talk a little bit about the subjects you're covering, what the experience for the student is like, and, and the distribution model, and how, how you get them? Absolutely. Right now, we're early stage startup. We're pre-revenue. Our product is about to be released in three weeks on Steam and Oculus Store. We're building our first experience. It's content. And I know you guys said you don't invest in content. But we're creating content to show people how engaging science and STEM fields can be. So with our experience, you start at the human scale, you shrink smaller and smaller, eventually end up at the size of atoms. We've tested this on users. And like seriously, it's brought tears to my eyes to see them, just the lights going on, that the things that they're studying, they're actually, they're not as abstract as it may appear to be. And is this? Um, rendered content, 360 content. What you mentioned, you have tools too. Um, what tools have you built in house to try to make content creation easier? Yes. So our content, everything is CGI built in Unreal Engine. Um, we actually take um, electron micrograph scans and render that. Um, so our responsibility is really to create content that's accurate. Um, as far as our um, tools, um, one of the things that we're seeing is that the tool aspect is something that, you know, the content is great, but we can really help with educators with that. Um, so we're really focused on, um, we're really focused on right now creating content that just helps it become more tangible to them. So the tools is kind of in our pipeline at this moment. Are you selling to schools or are you selling to individuals? We're selling to individuals because at this stage, most people that have the HTC Vive they can, or Oculus Rift, they can give it to their kids. They can show them that this is something that you can do that's beyond gaming. And that's one of the things. Um, many people that have already tried it, they said they want to put their kids in this and that this is something that's you know interesting for a wide range of people. 
Um, yeah, you should look a little bit into what Google Cardboard has done. They have actually very wide distribution in schools already, or very wide, somewhat wide distribution. Yeah. Um, but they're actually in retail stores now. Like if you in Europe and the U.S., you go, you can actually buy the classroom size package versus a school size package. And the Google Cardboard team, like they're desperate for content. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We were we uh, last time at VRLA, um, some of the people from Google were really interested in what we were doing, um, but we're really targeting just in such an early stage market, and so we can. And survive to really hit the people that have the hardware now because working with schools it's a very long process some of the time it's ready there's new versions do you think there are certain categories within education that render better for VR education um, what do you mean by categories like, like science versus history versus understanding computation um, for us um, we're really focused on the STEM fields um, just because a lot of people that have uh, VR are really kind of interested in those arenas and we feel that we can tap into them and um, they can be a good resource. So we're focused on STEM first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're content creation, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. So my name's Jeremy Warner. This is Jose Nunez. We're uh, business partners for Handboning Media. And what we're doing is we're an entertainment company that's really looking to the future of entertainment versus what's in Hollywood today or what the kind of thing is. So if you look at what's happening, it's mainly like, hey, I'm sitting back watching things. We're not a game, though, either, because what we want to do is we want to put the you in the middle of the action. So we're starting to create a bunch of different shows. Our first show is called Hobble Dee Hoy. And it's really focused on that kind of 12 to 14 year old range, which is this range that's asking their parents for all the headsets and whatnot. And so we're hitting on them and it's going to be kind of like a Futurama, Phineas and Ferb in outer space, where it's room scale, you can go around from room to room and actually interact with people in room. Our first step is to actually film it in 360 and then we're gonna start putting Unity over, or using Unity and overlay different interactive objects. Then from there, our second goal from there is to is to basically um, what we want to do is we want to focus on nonlinear storytelling, and so we feel that uh, the best way to do that is through interaction with the Unity engine, because uh, not only when you have a fragmented story that you're going to be able to uh, have a different experience every time, but it's actually going to incentivize you to go back and rewatch and get something out of it each time. And then eventually we want to add on a social interaction so you can go to a different party with your friends or you could go to different elements. So that's kind of our idea of what we're working on. Thank you. Yeah, social is key. I mean, I think as most of, I, mean, I assume all of you guys have gone into the halls or will go into the halls. I think social experiences in VR, even one more person makes it that much more interesting and gives it a lot more longevity than you know, a single piece of content that you walk through, even if it is multiple storylines and branching storylines and things like that. And um, to also, you know, where possible, as early as possible, I would try to think about how do you get um, content created by third parties or by your users, so you guys are not always the ones at the burden of creating every single detail in the world that you're building. Um, one of the main reasons why VCs don't fund content is because it's very expensive to create and you spend all of your work and effort and that thing might flop. Um, if you look at some of the content quote unquote companies that have succeeded tremendously, right, whether it's Minecraft or Roblox or even Supercell, all of their sort of <laughs> games and experiences have a huge component uh, that's all contributed by third parties and users and that's what allows them to sort of do it with like 50 people and not, you know, hundreds. So it sounds a little bit like maybe like what was the the book's called Goosebumps Goosebumps right? A little Similar. Bit. I mean, we're really looking way beyond that. Like we're looking at really where entertainment's going, and it's not you know what's going to be done for VR is not going to be what is Hollywood, and it's not going to be games 100% if we want to pull people on, and that's what we're looking at is hey how can we have something where you interact with the narrative but you don't always have to have a element that affects the agency, but you feel like you affect the agency, and so that's. I think where a lot of entertainment's going to go with VR, gaming's going to be one subsection, but there's gonna be something that has to be more for the masses, and that's what we're looking at. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you power your characters, what AI engine you're using, or if you're building that yourself? Because you said the user can go talk to characters in the world. Uh, we're looking at, 
I mean, right now we're in the beginnings of this, and I've been trying to experiment with Unity to create the different elements, and then from there we would be overlaying that on 360. And so we've been looking at different kind of 3D cameras to create the models for those. It's a puppet, uh, the first ones with puppets. And so it's really kind of taking very basic colors and using everything. It'd be kind of like Quell, the video game with VR, and using basic colors so that we could do stitching and other things in that early stage. I mean, it's a step-by-step -step process, and nothing's going to happen right away with the, the content and what distribution channels are available. So. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Bussinger, and I am the founder of Rithweer Incorporated. Uh, we have designed a unique hardware solution to the problem of full body, full speed motion in virtual reality. It's an omnidirectional treadmill, but it is done in a manner that is not currently being done by any other company. <clears throat> it allows full acceleration, full speed direction change, crawling, jumping, crouching, um, basically unlimited motion, um, uh, unlimited motion, sorry. Um, I'm currently the director of technical sciences at the University of Oregon, and they have signed on. They'll be getting a, an equity percentage, and we're rolling out a business from that space. Um, so that will have to be part of considerations as we move forward. Um, this is my first pitch, my first time talking about it publicly, actually. So the last two years have just been design, prototype construction, and proving that all the tech works and keeping an eye on all the competition and reading all the information that I could about it. Um, can you talk a little bit about how big this thing is, how much would it cost to buy? Yeah, um, our early customers are gonna be wealthy Kevin individuals. Sorry. <laughs> I want to crawl around my house. That sounds fun. Um, it's going to be enterprise, large institutions, military, things like that in the short run. The current model that we're looking to finish building out is going to be about eight feet in diameter and about eight feet tall. But the tech is very scalable. It's based on a technology that we have already proven. We can take down to a one-inch thick mat with two moving parts. Um, and yeah, we're really excited about. What are the, the use cases for it? Like you mentioned enterprise and? Uh, enterprise would be um, training athletes, um, rehab, and in the military, they want to you know, train soldiers and, and watch things like that. Those seem to be the three biggest spaces right now that are obvious. We're going to create markets, I think, with something that's this technologically innovative. But early on, those are the easy ones to hit. In the future, the vision is any user has their goggles on already, and they see in the corner of the room a portal, and they step into that portal and step into whatever the world they want to be in and take a walk on another planet holding hands with someone who's on the other side of the Earth. Um, full disclosure, we're a small investor in Virtuix, the Omni, so similar concept. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd be curious to know, in the future, do you envision creating your own content, or this is something that would be an external piece of hardware that would plug into anything? Uh, we're going to be able to plug into anything. Um, we're actually really counting on these other companies um, to develop some of the Axon VR, the haptic stuff. Um, I could see if there's some holes to fill, our company could fill those holes. But what we're really interested in doing is once, once the technology is widespread enough, we want to allow it to be very easily ported so that we are the central software port to allow an entire universe. So when you first enter this, the experience is you're on Rith, we are the planet. And, but there's an entire universe around that. And other companies, there's an Amazon planet. You can order something and it physically arrives the next day from Amazon, so on and so forth. So a lot of linkages. We aren't producing all that software. We're allowing it to, to link to us. Yeah, I, I like the enterprise angle. I mean, I think those are the guys, especially the military, who actually have very expensive solutions now that suck. Uh, so they've been looking yeah. for things like this. Um, I would say that it's very hard to actually 
um, you know, sort of sell a single component. Um, typically, the larger companies, they want to be able to buy sort of a, a whole solution. Um, so to the degree that, you know, let's say you don't want to build out some of the content or some piece of the software or some piece of the hardware, you know, as early as you can, you probably have to find other partners who can sort of go in for on that RFP together with you. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, having a single sort of point solution, um, it'll be challenging to, to get very far in an RFP. That's why I'm excited about it teaming with a venture capitalist group because I know it's more than just about money. It's the people you know, it's the, you know, those are the pieces that we need to pull together so that we can present a full package to the right customers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, my name's Anna and I am the founder of a company called Show My Property TV. We are the largest provider of normal video, shall we say, to the apartment space. So we're in our fourth year and all of our clients are apartment buildings, student housing and senior housing. And we didn't want to get into VR, but our customers kept asking us, hey, we want VR, hey, we want 360. So we've just started getting into it. We've shot less than 10 and um, it's kind of blowing up in our faces. We have the relationships already. We should do about 2.4 million in revenue this year, judging on this quarter. And that's just from our normal videos. So. Um, I think that the space is ready for it. Our customers have kind of led us that way. And yeah, I'm just looking for kind of advice from you guys of how to kind of quickly take on something new and move in another direction uh, using the existing client relationships that we already have. So that's it. So sorry, you're building your own 360 content or? No, so we shoot existing apartment communities. So if you live here and you want to see an apartment community there, the apartment community is our customer. So we go in, we shoot in 360 if it's already built and, and they're using those videos for marketing pieces. We have a lot of um, senior housing communities who are really, really interested because just the mobility issues of the senior people, you know, if you're moving into assisted care, get that kind of thing, you want to go and be able to view three or four properties and you just don't have the mobility. So I think that's going to be pretty big for us. How do you charge for something like that? Uh, we're playing with the numbers. Uh, we found that 15,000 to 50,000 seems acceptable. Um, our normal lifestyle videos, we charge between kind of 10,000 and 30,000. So this, depending on whether the building is new, they have more money or existing, they have a little bit less, but that <coughs> seems, all those numbers seems acceptable to our clients currently. And how are the, the viewers um, viewing it? Are they viewing it on like desktop and mobile or are you, are you actually putting them in headsets? Mostly headsets. So for the student housing clients that we have, they're taking, we're filming it for them and they're taking Samsung VR headsets or Google Cardboard to student housing fairs. And every single student that sees it wants to look at that particular building just because it's like we say VR is PR. They take it down there and it's this huge <laughs> buzz. So um, cardboards and, uh, and the headsets. I think um, you know you had asked for some advice on transitioning to a new medium, and yeah. when when building something in a new medium and a new way of allowing the consumer to experience something, truly maximizing on the potential of this new medium is critical. Right. And when you can look up, down, all around you, really taking advantage of that space and in dropping the, the user, whether it's a student or someone looking for senior housing, really dropping them in the center of that and showing them whether that is the beautiful architecture above them right. or the kind of the, the noise of the really vibrant crowd around them. And I think making sure that it's not just a copy paste of what already exists on mobile or on desktop top, but really emphasizing the richness that VR can bring uh, will allow for a truly good experience. Yeah, we've done a couple of shoots where we've had like a student housing property throw a huge party yeah. and put our cameras in the middle of it and they're like handing red cups and it's all going <laughs> crazy. So people have been loving that kind of stuff. So I'm guessing just to stay ahead of the game and just, you know, have good storytelling around VR is probably the way to yeah, go. Yeah, and in, in addition to having the, the gear for VR version of it, you know, if a lot of your traffic and a lot of your your users today are coming to your website, making sure you have a good web VR version of yeah, the product sure. is for also sure. going to reduce some of the friction uh, and increase the opportunities for you to get in front of all your existing customers too. Cool. 
And are you um, are you shooting all the content yourself, or using third party like production houses to do it? A little bit of both. So um, with our kind of existing company, we have shooters all over the place. But obviously, it's easy because it's not 360. So we we have in house, but we're trying to figure out because we have clients in every single state. So it's like we have to be able to offer them VR, same as we do video. So we're definitely looking at like the smaller production companies and the guys just getting into it. But of course, consistency is is an issue. Yeah. So that's yeah. the kind of stuff that we're working at right now. Thanks for the advice, guys. Hello, I'm Sean Voltaire. Um, what we're working on is an operating system uh, in virtual reality called Omega. Users can um, use their hands to build objects and apps in VR. Uh, they can use um, a visual programming system to give objects functionality. And I'm sorry, I'm out of breath because I actually just ran here. <laughs> um, so it has applications for um, nearly anything because we can do anything you can normally do on a computer while also being able to simulate any real-world experience. So we've had users um, build objects, and then um, we've built a file manager to look at objects on your hard drive. We've built an email client uh, and also various games. Um, we've done educational um, experiences. Uh, we've partnered with an um, engineering company to build a uh, training demo for uh, radiation safety testing. Um, and we're also working with an artist right now um, for a new hardware solution that he's developed, and we're creating this artistic experience for him. Uh, so just imagine like being able to use any 3D app, any normal app, but in 3D, where all the buttons and dials are at your, at your fingertips, and you can uh, program and extend this yourself using a very natural, intuitive way. And we think this is a, um, an evolution of human-computer interaction, where instead of a keyboard and mouse, you're able to use your own hands and your own body as the input device and get visual and physical feedback from objects. So are these like templates you're building that people can then go in and then um, change them, or are people creating stuff from scratch? Are you building, is this a standalone tool? Is it, based, is it on top of a platform like Unity? Um, the prototype has been built in Unity, but um, the, uh, the engine actually doesn't allow for as much power as we need it to. So we are currently working on a, uh, a build, an engine from scratch. Um, it, right now, it runs on Windows, and so you could uh, run normal Windows applications. As far as uh, the templates and stuff, it is possible to build templates and have people build off of them. It is also possible to build things from scratch. So, just like Google with Android One, like we're expecting to build basic apps and then uh, have an app store where people can expand on that and then like bring more ideas into the space. And we're really interested in seeing how users uh, solve different problems in VR because we don't have to solve these problems for everybody and they're not beholden to what we decide to develop. Um, they can have their own freedom uh, to do what they, they want. And it's kind of like Minecraft on steroids, but also with programming functionality. Um, can you talk to a little, little bit about how people are using the actual body and hands as input or using Leap Motion or some other external tool? Yeah. Um, right now, we're working with the Vive. Uh, we plan to support any hardware, but right now, we're just using Prototype. Um, but yes, uh, with Leap Motion, imagine being able to use your fingers and perform gestures and grab objects. And we're really looking forward to a future where you just stand in front of a depth camera with only your body, and you can use your entire body to gesture and like sword fight or um, use like engineering apps or sound production, video production. Sounds like you're trying to build a platform, you know, replace a new operating system exactly. as, you, as you described it. Who on your team has experience um, building these types of ecosystems before? Um, frankly, no one. Um, oh, I'd get someone on your team that understands how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would just, I mean, like, I think, yes, you can always go sort of the go broad strategy of, like, let's see what content creators and, you know, figure out and what is good versus not. And also you can go down more curated paths of, like, I think these are some of the most obvious areas that people should be building apps in and let's make those guys' job easier, cater the tools a little bit to them. Um, <laughs> There's you know pros and cons to either, but at least for me personally, typically when it's this early in a platform cycle and people have 
you know, people already don't quite know what they want to build. Uh, they're using things like Unity already. Like, you really have to give folks a reason to come and use your tool yeah. uh, to create, as opposed to anything else. And and so having you know a little bit more, or just at least highlighting certain kinds of apps um, or tools, uh, you know, that can be better built using what you have uh, is important. I think. Yeah, we've heard that advice a lot, um, but it doesn't really make sense to us because um, <coughs> if if you can display text and images and web browsing, and you can also display any object you want, and also give these uh, scripting functionalities with Python or C++ or our visual programming language, then we've built all those things, and you can create any app from those basic building blocks, which, which we've done with engineering education or art experiences, things like that. Um, do you have any more like to talk about that? Because we do hear that advice a lot, and um, we're afraid we've actually heard that when we build when application we show people this, they say, "Oh, Omega is for architecture." Or blah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and then well, so that's it. fine. I mean, if you do that, then it's important for you, regardless to whoever made good pieces of applications on your platform, to go chase them down and help them out and make sure those tools get more highlighted. Yeah. Um, yeah. In that case, you're just sort of having your users figure out what's really, really good. But again, you need to still curate those guys and make sure that they're getting sort of all the help they can. Yes. Are, thank you. Do we have anybody else? There's one more. OK. Come on. I won't even wait for it to start. My name is Nick Robinson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Reality Check. And we've created the very first social VR game show platform. So experiences like The Price is Right, Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, they're mainstays of entertainment. Mobile trivia games are consistently the top downloaded and the top grossing games. So we want to take that scale and bring the immersive experience of being on a game show. So our first uh, proof of concept was called Kiss or Kill. Valve selected that to be showcased at the Game Developer Conference earlier this year. Um, and we've been building this out and getting it ready for market. I'm the former chief marketing officer of Quest Nutrition, where we built a billion dollar brand in five years. My co-founder is a great technologist. He's uh, created apps with hundreds of millions of downloads. We have the world's expert in free to play mechanic design. And we've got the producer of CBS's Candy Crush. So we're ready to scale this out. Uh, and bring immersive game show experiences to the entire world. Uh, sounds like you've assemb assembled quite the team with relevant experience to do this, and uh, sounds super interesting. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you mean by immersive and what VR allows this type of gaming to do that can't be done in traditional TV or something else? Right, so this is you know, built in Unity. So this is a, you know, it's a game with game mechanics. It's player versus player. Um, it'll start as two player. You know, obviously we can scale that. And then also there is a real time human host. Um, there's also an artificial intelligent option, but you actually have a real host doing this. Again, these are all avatar based um, in, in VR, um, but that's gonna allow us to scale this and bring on influencers to be hosts and you know, bring out the, the ecosystem to a, to a wider level. Where, where are people consuming this? So right now, this is in the prototype phase. Um, so we're still. Where will they? So the, they will be playing this on the Vive, on the Oculus, on the on the premium headsets. What about the viewers? So the viewers will be able to watch live in VR, or you'll be able to watch it back flat. So we'll have flat exports, both full length of the best episodes, and then each uh, each match will have a GIF export of about 10 seconds of the best thing that happened. To the viewer of these game shows and the person who's playing them today, yeah. what is exciting about it? Is it the idea that in VR I can be on stage, or is it the feeling of achievement when I know all the answers, and that can be done really easily on mobile when I'm commuting to work or something? So, so as, as we built the prototype, a thing that we really focused on was how do we make this make sense in VR, right? It can't just be let's slap VR into a game. So how do we create it and make it fully immersive? So the prototype is Jeopardy with weapons. So you are able to smack the person over the head with a mallet right before they answer. It blurs their vision, distorts their audio. So finding mechanics to add in, that can only happen in VR. That's cool, yeah. Um, and yes, I, I agree. I think you should think quite a bit about Obviously, you know, making sure this experience can be viewed by people without a VR headset as well. Yeah. Um, it's exactly the kind of thing where you get an influencer in there, you know, as the host or as the participant, um, and things can go pretty crazy. And uh, it's the kind of thing that you know, existing audience on YouTube or Twitch or whatnot would find really interesting as well. Yeah. And obviously, to attract an influencer, if you tell them, hey, you can access a thousand VR uh, consumers, uh, you know, concurrently versus your existing, you know. 
50,000 uh, followers on Twitch, I think you have to sort of be able to dress the ladder. Yeah, I mean, the good news is I have great relationships with them. Um, that's how we built the brand was with really strong influencers. And there's a handful of them who understand getting into a platform early allows them, just like they did on YouTube, right? So in 2006, if you were on YouTube, small audience, and then that turned into something very profitable for them. Um, so creating that for them, uh, you know, they, some of them understand it. Also, well, in 2018, there's going to be a mobile extension app. Um, so if you're sitting at home, your friend is in VR, you'll be able to participate on mobile as well. And we're here, booth F34. Come by, play. It's fun. Sounds awesome. Good. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's all we got. I had more questions. I'm sure you did, too. So. Um, I guess we'll just have to hold them. We'll all move that way. We need to clear the room. But thank you all for coming. Thank you, panelists. Great job and uh, very insightful. Thank, thank you. you.